According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our growth comes through the scriptures. Join me tonight as we get started in Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 this evening as we get started. We've had four lessons to introduce the book. And uh, now tonight we're ready to move on to uh, the actual first part of the verse-by-verse -verse development. We'll uh, see if we can get as far as verses 1 and 2 and how long that takes us. Then uh, this is also Wednesday night, I'm reminded, so that we want to open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll take a few minutes for some questions and answers. Then uh, after that, we'll get to our Ephesian study. So before we do anything else, let's take a moment for silent prayer to give every believer priest the opportunity to confess any sins that need to be confessed, quiet your heart, set aside the distractions, and just humble yourself under the blessing of the Word of God. Shall we pray? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight thankful for your truth and the blessings of studying to show ourselves approved. Your word commands us to, to be here, to assemble together, to receive this instruction. And what an easy command to obey, Father, because your word is so delightful. We, we treasure it. We feast upon it. We thank you for the privilege and blessing that it is to, to come before your throne of grace. And so, Father, as we study to show ourselves approved as workmen needing not to be ashamed, we thank you for the teaching ministry of God the Holy Spirit to open our eyes, open our ears, and soften our hearts. Might we receive the word implanted, Father, able to save our souls. We thank you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, the uh, microphone is ready to go, and so we can take some lead-off questions and also keep an eye on YouTube in case there's a YouTube question. And then I did have one, the follow-up from last week, uh, that came on email. What scripture passages support the age of accountability? And so we were talking about the age of accountability last week. We were talking about children who pass away before they're old enough to hear the gospel and respond by faith. And so uh, this is a doctrine that's called the age of accountability, and it's not taught in any single passage, but it kind of is the uh, deductive conclusion to several passages put together. And so I think primarily you have uh, 2 Samuel 12, 23, when uh, David's child passed away and uh, he was only seven days old. Obviously, that's not old enough to hear the gospel and respond by faith. Um, but when the child has died, David said, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. And in case that's fuzzy at all, in case it's not clear where David thought he was going, uh, you can combine that with Psalm 23, 6, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, right? This is the surely goodness and mercy passage in Psalm 23. Will follow me all the days of my life, my physical life, and then when all the days of my physical life are complete, then where does David expect to go? He says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so you combine those together, and uh, that's, that's the expectation David has for where this child went. Um, there will be some other supportive passages, including Numbers 14, um, with respect to uh, in the Exodus event in the wilderness generation, uh, anyone that was below the age of 20, the children, they were, uh, they were preserved. Uh, it's just a concept, a principle there. Uh, there's also Deuteronomy 139 that talk about your little ones uh, that have no knowledge of good or evil. That's an interesting definition for the little ones uh, this day who have no knowledge of good or evil. And this speaks to their innocence in their childhood, their ignorance, I should say, in their childhood. They're not morally innocent. They're still sinners in Adam, but they are not culpable with respect to their, the, their ignorance of this standard. Um, I would also include uh, Isaiah 7. Uh, the prophecy of the uh, virgin shall conceive and bear a son. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. And so this is a stage of child development as a certain age where they are morally accountable because they've been trained in obedience versus disobedience, evil and good, uh, things of that nature. 
Then uh, Jonah 4.11, should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between the right hand and the left, as well as many animals. So that speaks to, the, of course, the, the pagans, the heathens, the unbelievers. They are morally accountable, and God's going to have mercy on them, but also the children and the animals, the others that would suffer in the destruction of Nineveh. That's why Jonah didn't want to go and preach repentance. Then some other partially related, they're not really related, but there's a concept there. Um, obviously, uh, uh, Romans 3.20, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That again speaks to particular information that leaves a person culpable. Uh, Romans 4 is no violation. That's a principle. And then uh, Romans 5.13 until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Okay? Now, these are passages that are dealing with other issues, like the time frame between Adam and Moses, and, uh, and how God was dealing with humanity prior to Mosaic law. But setting all that aside, we can just glean the fundamental issues that actually are hinted at, that are alluded to in these uh, passages. And I think uh, we can connect them as well with the concept of the, uh, the age of accountability. So anyway, that's... The answer to that, I'm going to go ahead and mark this as completed. And we're ready for some new questions tonight. We'll start with Doug over here. Is it an easy one or a hard one? All right, I'm teasing. Well, it's based on what we, we just uh, went through. And uh, our Lord uh, had to reach the age of accountability also. Well, that's what that Isaiah passage is about, where um, talking about a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and quite noteworthy that even as a toddler, even as a little kid, he has a capacity, and I think that there's a Holy Spirit or, or some fashion, right? He was preserved in his humanity, so he didn't throw a two-year-old uh, you know, temper tantrum and disqualify himself from going to the cross, right? Those, right. those terrible twos are, are terrible. terrible. But um, if, you know, I've raised four of them myself. I, I get that. Uh, but there was some provision that was made to bring Jesus to that point. You know, when he was 12, he was dazzling the, the, the Pharisees and the PhDs in the temple and whatnot. Um, that didn't just start when he was 12. I mean, he was grounded at the youngest of ages. And so... There's, a, there's an element there, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, other questions tonight? We'll cross to the far side of the room. I love this. Yeah, we always go from the farthest left to the farthest right. Keeps our uh, microphone runner going. To the Tams, right? Children. Um, the, the naming of children, you know, I know a lot of times it was a family name or, um, but it just seems like sometimes they they name their kid some negative thing, you know, and, you know, like, you know, to, oh, the son of my sorrow or say, you know, and uh -huh. the poor kid would grow up with the, you know, <laughs> did they, did they, some of them wait a while before they name their child to see what the character of the child might be like, or, I mean, I know it's different. But it just seems the negative thing seems like, why would you name your kid something? Yeah, yeah, I know. It makes it, yeah, kind of interesting. You know. And some of it is cultural that we don't, maybe don't relate to so much. Uh, only in one instance, when, when Rachel gave Benjamin the name yeah. she gave him, then, ben then Jacob overruled that and, and said, no, not Benoni. He'll be Benjamin, son of my right hand. Um, so, you know, if, if the father disapproved of what the mom came up with, you know, we have an example of that. Um, it's, it's not entirely clear. I don't think every example I can think of from Scripture, the, the child was given the name at the point of their birth. That they, that they didn't wait for a, a period of time. Uh, it might be that they were given subsequent names later on, that they might have been given additional names down the road. Uh, but uh, no, the name they were given at birth is the name that, that the father assigned to them. Makes you think, though, doesn't it? Yeah, I, just I think a lot of times there was wishful thinking because the kid turned out to be a total wreck, but he had a great name. <laughs> you know. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, good question on that. Robert, is your hand up or not? No, okay. All right, Rudy has his hand up. Uh, 
Uh, was the book of Matthew written before the book of Mark or the other way around? Ooh, now here's a fight. Um, so the, the real answer is we don't know. Okay, the real answer is we don't know. Uh, and there are scholars that, uh, that, that think so. In fact, the earliest traditions we have, the reason why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in that order in our Bibles is because that's the order traditionally that we're written in. Uh, later on came some German liberals and some other Bible skeptics and, and folks that, that created this legend of, of Mark in priority. And it still tends to be trendy in a lot of scholarship today, even though the bait, the, one of the partner studies that goes with Mark in priority is this concept of Q. And, uh, and, and Q is now, uh, I think, disproven as far as I'm concerned. There is no Q. There never was. And uh, no archaeologist has ever found a, a shred or a scrap of, of anything that could be identified as, as Q. So uh, I'm willing to say Q is a myth. Uh, the, the liberal Germans are ridiculous. And, um, and I, I really don't see a need for, um, for Mark to be written first. Uh, but nor do I see a need for why it fundamentally really matters. So um, I tend to think Matthew came first, and then uh, Mark was, uh, whether he knew about it or not, whether he used that material or not, um, I don't think he needed to use that material because he had the Holy Spirit inspiring scripture, right? So, uh, but he learned everything he learned from Peter, and then under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Mark wrote his gospel. And... Um, if it happens to be very similar to a, a shorter version of Matthew, that's okay. Does that help? Okay. Long answer to a short question. All right, now Robert has one now. Sort of a follow-on to that. Uh, the uh, Hebrew Christian movement seems to have accepted with no foundation whatsoever the idea that Matthew was originally written in Hebrew and translated, or Aramaic, and translated into Greek. Mm -hmm. But there's that, no manuscripts, there's no, not even a shred of evidence, but it seems to be important to them. Well, they have a shred. They have, uh, they have, a, um, they have a, testament, a testimony on the part of Papias. Papias said something to that effect, or at least Eusebius quoted that Papias said something to that effect. So th there, is, there is documentation to support that tradition that goes back to at least the third century. So today's uh, Messianic Jewish background Christians, they're not just making that up. That, that, that goes back some time. Yeah. Okay, we'll give the cleanup hitter there the last question. I have to answer this in two minutes, though. <laughs> the preterists tried to put Revelation in around 67, 68 AD. Mm -hmm. Would you give a synopsis of why that is not accurate? Yeah, so they have to. They absolutely have to because they start with the presupposition that everything in the book of Revelation is complete. It's in the past. It was fulfilled with the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and which we think is ridiculous, right? Because you have to, you can't take it literally, obviously. Uh, is Satan bound in the abyss? Is, is Jesus sitting on the throne in Jerusalem? Are we, you know, did, did we miss the millennium somewhere? I mean, they have to, they have to dismiss so much of, of revelation as, as figurative or allegorical. But anyway, that's what they do, and they insist on having a, a date prior to 70 AD. Obviously, if it was written in 96 AD, which I believe it was, well then that just destroys their theory just at face value, right? So um, there's other problems with preterism. For example, I mean, if it, if it was written in the 60s and then fulfilled just two years after that, why? And why put it in the Bible? What, why does it even get canonized? What, what point is there? To, to revelation in the canon if, in fact, the preterist view is, is correct. So there's, it just destroys the purpose for the book. The book actually tells us you're blessed if you read it, you're blessed if you pay heed to the warnings. Uh, it's, it's the, the, everything we have as futurists to look forward to. So anyway, that's the short answer to that. Appreciate that. All right. 
Let's turn to Ephesians now. I appreciate that. If I did not get to your question, um, then I'll let you go first next week. How's that sound? Just remind me, I owe, uh, I owe you to go first next week. All right. Also, I appreciate your prayer. Sunday morning, I asked for a prayer. I was highlighting on the fact that uh, these um, trying to go back to the old PowerPoint mode that I had done previously, uh, I was just out of practice and I was not comfortable with it. And, and I thought, now, is, is, is somebody putting a gun to my head? Why do I have to go back to this? You know, can we not just stick with what we learned to do in the, through the Bible year and, uh, and use the Logos software uh, as our teaching uh, display? So I asked for you to pray about that. And wouldn't you know it, let's get rid of that. And I went ahead and put the Ephesians notes up there on the screen. So uh, just like we did with Through the Bible, you're going to see the printed notes. You're going to see the uh, study notes on the left. You're going to see the Bible on the right. And we'll have other things as well that we can bring and pop up and whatnot. But we're going to use this as a basic layout like we did last year, all for the Through the Bible format. And... Um, so yes, the notes are on the left. Those are not inerrant, God-breathed, inspired, or anything at all. They're, they're probably full of a lot of typos and problems and things. Feel free to fix them, okay? Feel free to raise your hand and say uh, you have a, a bad reference there, like you did on Sunday when I had Acts chapter 7, and it should have been Acts chapter 6, okay? And I need to fix that in these notes here too. Uh, so anyway, this is what we're going to go with here tonight. So as we turn to Ephesians 1.1... 1, 1, and I'm going to get past the introduction. All of this is the introduction that we went through for the first four classes. And so now we're ready for Acts chapter one, uh, for Ephesians chapter 1. All right. Ephesians chapter 1. Here is a, an overview for the chapter and kind of give you a, a, a broad outline for how we're going to break this chapter down. We're going to give you three separate outlines for the first chapter. Uh, we're going to start with uh, the salutation in verses 1 and 2, and that's going to go faster than, than you might expect. Ephesians opens with a standard, if short, salutation in verses 1 and 2. That's going to be our first outline, and that's the one that we have here that's titled Salutation and Thanksgiving. That salutation is then followed by an unparalleled patrological eulogy. And I've highlighted this several times in the course of the introductory lessons. Uh, so much of Ephesians is paralleled elsewhere. The salutation is paralleled everywhere that Paul writes anything. The, um, much of Ephesians is paralleled in Colossians. Uh, there's other elements of Ephesians that are paralleled in, in Corinthians and Romans and other of the Pauline uh, epistles. But what's unparalleled jumps out at us, and it starts right away in verses 3 through 14 of chapter 1. It is a patrological eulogy. It is a statement of blessedness. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And we've got a trinity of blessings right there in verse 3, because God the Father is blessed. He has blessed us. And what has he blessed us with? Blessings. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And so this verse is going to take us a while. And really, all of these verses from 3 through 14 are going to take us into some of the deepest stuff we've ever touched. And uh, positional truth doctrines and uh, the spiritual blessings, the heritage of the royal family of God. This is who we are. All right? Understand that the church in the New Testament is not Israel in the Old Testament. And understand what this new creation that comes about. Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. And a new creation comes about on the day of Pentecost in 33 AD. And this church, this heavenly citizenship, this heavenly body, the mystical body and bride of Jesus Christ is an amazing thing. And this is why the song, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, Benediction here is a, or this eulogy is praising God the Father for what he has brought about in Christ. The Father wants to glorify Christ and he's doing so primarily through the church. This is what we're going to see in these verses. All right. So we're going to take verses 1 and 2, make that an outline. We're going to take verses 3 through 14 and make that an outline. And then uh, we will conclude the chapter with the wish prayer. The eulogy is followed by a thankful wish prayer. And if you've never heard the phrase wish prayer before, uh, I'll introduce it when we get to verses 15 through 23. 
But for this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you in your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you. All right, so there's the thankfulness. While making mention of you in my prayers. And what are these prayers about? It's more than being thankful. It starts with a thankfulness, but then it goes on with the, the wishing. It goes on with the requests that we're making before the creator God of the universe. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And so really verses 15 through 23 is Paul's prayer for his Ephesian readers to have God the Father open their eyes to this spiritual revelation. And this is my prayer for this church. It's my prayer for all of us that God will open our eyes and this is what we're going to see and this is what we're going to know. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know. All right? This is the thing. You know, when, when you're first saved, what do you know? You're, you're pretty ignorant. You, you're kind of oblivious. You know that your sins are forgiven. You know that you're saved, right? Because that's the consequence of, of what you were promised when, when the gospel was presented. You know, having believed in Christ, that you're going to go to heaven when you die. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a little bit that you know just based upon what you're responding to in the, in the gospel call. But beyond that, what do you know? Nothing. And, and even worse, you might think you know some things based upon, uh, you know, what you thought when you were an unbeliever or what you heard or just different rumors or different things. Um, maybe religious people you were exposed to in your, in your life of an unbeliever. Anyway, there's a whole lot that you think you might know that you have to unlearn and relearn and, and, and get appropriately uh, taught to you as the Holy Spirit uh, leads you into the truth. So verses 15 through 23, that's going to be an amazing section as well. And I don't know how long this is going to take because the, the, the eulogy is going to take us quite a while. The wish prayer is going to take us quite a while. And, and don't be shocked if, if I'm drawing Social Security by the time we get to uh, chapter 2. It's going to be... It's going to be something else. All right. But that's not tonight. Tonight we're going to start with verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. I'm going to go ahead and teach this as if the words at Ephesus are legitimate. I believe they belong in there, even though they're missing in a handful of manuscripts, that uh, there's nothing wrong with putting the words at Ephesus in there, since the overwhelming majority of our manuscripts have the words in there. And this has uh, traditionally been the, the, the epistle to the Ephesians for 2,000 years. I have no issue with calling it the book of Ephesians. Um, but let's take a look at it. First of all, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. The very first word of the book is Paul. So when the liberals come along and tell you that Paul didn't write this book, just say, okay, we're one word into our study here, and we know that you're wrong, <laughs> okay? We just have it in, as far as what it says. The plain language of Scripture says Paul wrote this. And it is so similar to everything else that Paul wrote, it's almost, you, you have an incredible burden of proof on the other side to say, you know, uh, if Paul didn't write this, who could have other than the Apostle Paul? And why would someone in close association with Pauline thought, why would he lie? Why would he forge something as if he was Paul? That's, that's the antithesis of who, who Paul actually was. Anyway, the name Paul, uh, the Greek paulos, it's not really technically even a Greek name, but it does come from the Latin uh, Roman surname. And it's curious, it's a Roman surname. Not a Roman given name. It's not a, not a first name. It's a last name, we might say. Okay? Although the Roman system is a bit different than what we function in here today. Um, the only other example that we have in the Bible besides the Apostle Paul is the character in Acts 13, who was a Roman officer. He was a proconsul. You remember this? So this is in the first missionary journey when Paul and Barnabas were traveling through uh, the island of Cyprus. And uh, they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos. They found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was uh, with the proconsul. Okay? If you're not familiar with, with Roman politics, he's the top dog. He, he is the number one guy in this province. In this, there's nobody that outranks him. And uh, his name is Sergius Paulus. Okay? And so it's not a praying omen, it's a cognomen, as, as we understand it. Uh, but in any event, 
I think a lot of this, this uh, Grace Notes has a good study, if you want to download it, just on Roman naming conventions. And you can get it off of Warren's uh, website there, and it's useful. Or go to Wikipedia and get another. Uh, it's, that's a useful page, too. Anyway, Sergius Paulus, uh, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. And then notice, it's just a few verses later in verse 9, this is the hinge event when Saul changes his name. Saul of Tarsus, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him. And so this episode with, uh, with a Roman proconsul is, the, is what triggers Paul to change his own name. And he's known as Paul from that moment forward. Also, by the way, this is when it gets flipped, when, when Barnabas and Saul becomes Paul and Barnabas from this moment forward. Okay? You know, it'd be like a rebellion on the part of uh, Robin and Batman. And you start to say, wait a minute. Who's this Robin and Batman going on? It's always Batman or, or Tonto and the Lone Ranger or something like that. You're, you're flipping over the, the sidekick now is the, is the top, top banana. Anyway, except for that one verse in Acts 13, 7, the other 157 times in the New Testament where you have Paulos uh, appearing, uh, they all apply to uh, the Apostle Paul the former Pharisee formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, all right? And so he is the um, author, and there's no question on that. But then it goes on to say, um, apostle, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And here is where we, we've got to be clear on what this means, and we don't want to get goofy with it, but we understand the role of the apostles and the prophets and the nature of the early church. All right? This is an office that does not exist today in, uh, in our day and age. The apostles uh, and the prophets were established by the Lord for the initial, the foundation of the church. You don't build a foundation for 2,000 years. You don't, at some point, you have to stop building the foundation so you can build the structures. You can put a roof on it. You can finish this thing, right? If, if apostles and prophets are a permanent gift then the, the imagery of a building is totally inappropriate. The idea of a foundation that never stops being laid, that's, that's not a foundation. <laughs> I mean, a foundation has to stop at some point. That's the nature of a foundation. And uh, you can't have an eternal foundation that just never stops being, being expanded. Anyway, we'll talk about this as well. The idea of an apostle. The Greek noun apostolos, A-P-O-S-T-O-L-O-S, -O -O Strong's number 652. Um, you know, stello to send, apostello to send out. The idea of, uh, I put the verb there also for you, apostello is number 649. Um, there's a lot that goes into this, and secular Greek uses it as well. Secular Greek uses it of ship captains or fleet admirals. Uh, it's used uh, of ambassadors. It's used of somebody with a commission. This is not just sending somebody out for, for milk, right? This is not just sending somebody on an errand or a messenger of some sort. This is somebody that is sent with a commission, with authority, somebody that is representing the one who sent them. That becomes fundamental. As the Father sent me, so send I you. This is, uh, this is the nature of, of who the apostles were representing Jesus Christ in the foundation of the church age. Now, there are um, a few places where uh, the term is used um, more uh, broadly, where the term is used more generically. So I think it's useful that we can see those and at least admit that they do exist. Uh, that even though it is a technical term, it can have usage beyond the apostles of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm trying to say. Here he says he's an apostle of Christ Jesus. So if you want to know what kind of apostle he is, he's an apostle of Christ Jesus. Now, if that's the only kind of apostles ever, then it kind of becomes a tautology, right? It becomes nonsensical. Well, why bother saying that if that's the only kind there are? Are apostles of Christ Jesus. Now, there are other kinds of apostles. Just the ones that appear most often in the uh, Bible are the apostles of Christ Jesus. But there are others. For example, there are local church envoys, apostles of a local church that are mentioned. For example, in 2 Corinthians 8.23, this was a study that we had years ago when we were in the 2 Corinthians series. Paul says, as for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. And so we've got um, vocabulary there as well that we want to pay attention to. And if guys like uh, 
oh, Jody Dillo and, and others that, that really have done well in writing about metakoi and koinonoi and other expressions. So the word for partner there is the koinonos, the, 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 the man in fellowship. And fellow worker, there's your soon ergos. And then, as for our brethren, they are the apostles of the churches, a glory to Christ. Now, the New American Standard didn't want to put the word apostles in there, so they, they translated it as messengers, and then they put it in a footnote, okay? Letting you know that literally, the Greek noun there is apostolos, or plural apostoloi. They are apostles of the churches, a glory of Christ. But this is good. We don't have to apologize for the word apostles being in there because it, it, they're not apostles of Christ Jesus. They're apostles of the Macedonian churches. And that gets our attention. That's actually very useful for us to say, okay, they are commissioned representatives. They have been sent on a mission to represent those churches. In what way? You know, they speak on behalf of those churches. They, they're conveying, in fact, in this team, they're conveying a, a significant financial gift that's being sent to Jerusalem to, to, re, to provide help for the saints that are there. Anyway, I find that to be a useful expression. They are uh, apostles of the churches, a glory to Christ. Therefore, openly before the churches, show them the proof of your love and of our reason for boasting about you. So how you respond to these apostles, these church apostles, is how those churches they represent are going to be, uh, they're going to be viewing you. Another example would be Philippians 2.25. <clears throat> Remember in the book of Philippians, Paul was in prison. He didn't know whether he was going to live or die. didn't know which to pray for. He says, to live as Christ, to die as gain. And while he was there, the church at Philippi heard that he was there, and they decided that they were going to commission Epaphroditus to, to bless the, the Apostle Paul and to minister to the Apostle Paul. And he's referenced here in this way in Philippians 2.25. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who was also your apostle and minister to my need also your apostle. Again, the New American Standard did the same thing they did in the last text we looked at there. They went ahead and translated apostolo, apostolos as messenger instead of apostle. And then in a footnote, they said, okay, literally it's apostle. That's the word that's there. Well, then why be afraid of it? Just translate it and let it go. Also, minister. Liturgos. Think of liturgy. I find this interesting, too. It's not the kind of ministry you would think of in terms of a deacon ministry. It's not a diaconeo ministry. It is a liturgos ministry, which means that he is functioning as, you know, you could think of the, the, the priest ministering before the altar. You could think of a priesthood ministry. And his service, his apostolic commission to serve the Apostle Paul is a priesthood ministry on behalf of the, uh, the church at Philippi. Minister to my need. All right, so there's a couple of examples where the noun apostle can refer to a commissioned representative, a, uh, a, a, a messenger that's not necessarily an apostle of Jesus Christ. However, most of the uses that we have, and apostolos is used 78 times in the New Testament, almost all of them are with reference to the apostles of, of Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, between the, the noun and the verb. Mostly this, this expression is used for those that are commissioned by Jesus Christ to the apostolic ministry of the church. And this is curious, all right? And this is what we want to we understand. What were these guys commissioned to do? Why did he unleash them on this world <laughs> when he ascended to the Father and took his seat at the Father's right hand? And even before that, because he commissioned the first batch of these guys during the 40 days of his resurrection ministry, before he ascended, before he was seated. So this is worth uh, reviewing as well. Uh, those commissioned by Jesus Christ to the apostolic ministry of the church. And these are good verses. Um, just to tuck them away in your tool belt. Just have them handy when people come to you and ask. Because you might encounter folks today. I've, I've encountered folks today that claim to be apostles. 
And it's just, it's, it's unfortunate that they, they use that language. Um, that, you know, they just need some adjustment like uh, Apollos needed when Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and explained the way of the Lord more accurately to them. Actually, I encountered it most of all uh, in, in Africa, all over the place in Africa. There's apostle this, apostle that. Um, a lot of the, the African churches are um, really impacted with a lot of Pentecostal uh, leanings and, and, and things of that nature. So let's go to the scriptures and ask ourselves, what does it mean to be an apostle? Okay, because Paul says he's an apostle according to the will of God, right? So you can't be an apostle, yeah, by the will of God. And there's other expressions for how he became an apostle. We'll see those as well. But let's look at some of these passages that define for us, what does it mean? What are the requirements? What are the qualifications to be an apostle? Can you just make yourself an apostle? Can you uh, print up some business cards and say, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of being Pastor Bob. I want to be Apostle Bob. Okay? I just promote myself. Okay? No, you just can't make yourself an apostle. You have to be chosen by Jesus Christ, and you have to be an eyewitness of his resurrection. I'm not old enough. Nobody today is. Okay? And I've told people that when they've, I've had them knocking on the church door and they announce themselves as Apostle so-and-so, and it's, it's impossible. You're not old enough. Get out of here. All right. Part of the uh, logic here of 1 Corinthians chapter 9 when Paul is talking about his liberty, okay? He says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? I mean, he's just using these rhetorical questions. Obviously, he is free. He has all the liberty of a church-age saint and, and more. I mean, he's got more liberty than we have because, you know, think about the liberty that the apostles have. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? And then right after he asked that question, he says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Now that is connected immediately after the noun apostle because this is fundamentally a necessary requirement to be an apostle. Remember when the 12 were, when the 11 were uh, uh, before Pentecost, the 11 in Acts chapter 1 are deciding, hey, you know what? We need, to, we need to replace Judas Iscariot. What did they do? They had to go to all of the eligible eyewitnesses and select somebody among that, among that group. You had to be an eyewitness. Have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? And then he goes on. In fact, before I go on, let me, uh, let me look at that one there in Acts chapter 1. I should have put that in the notes as well. So, um, they have to choose somebody to replace... Uh, Judas. So, Peter stands up. I'm sorry for the side trip. <laughs> Taking it to Acts chapter 1 here. The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descends. The church just had a birthday. There are now 120 spirit-indwelled church-age believers, and they're all in the same room. So before anybody leaves this room, we've got to take care of this item of business. So Peter stands up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons was there together. And he said, brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. Judas was a real apostle as an, as an unbeliever. This man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle. All his intestines gushed out. Okay? Wow. That makes his colonoscopy really easy to perform. And it became... I'm sorry, that's gross. We were discussing colonoscopies earlier tonight. All right. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate, let no one dwell in it, let another man take his office. Therefore, it is necessary that of all the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. That's a three and a half year ministry of Jesus Christ. From the time that he was baptized by John the Baptist to the time that he ascended on the Mount of Olives. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Fundamentally, this is the role of the apostles. 
eyewitnesses and commissioned to represent Jesus in the foundation of the church. So they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was called Justice, and Matthias. Another verse for your name question there about how many names did these guys have. And they prayed and they said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen. See, it comes down to that. Jesus makes the choice. We don't choose ourselves. Matthias didn't pick himself. No apostle does. Just like no high priest takes the honor for himself. Which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place? There is a mysterious question for you. Somebody asked me that on a Wednesday night. Why don't you? All right. So they drew lots from them and the lot fell to Matthias. This is the method by which they seek God's will. They, they just let, leave it in God's hands. The drawing of lots. And uh, they just trust that God has sovereignty over, you know, every, every cast lot. The decision is in, in God's hands. So he was added to the 11 apostles. He's counted as one of the 12 from that moment forward. All right, so being an eyewitness, this is absolutely key. And when, when back to, side trips over now, back to 1 Corinthians 9, when he says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord and yes, he did, on the Damascus Road, and then for three years in Arabia, when uh, Jesus Christ gave Paul his own personal church-age seminary training, he received from the Lord that which he delivered to you. And all of the doctrine that he received, he didn't receive from the apostles, he didn't receive from men. He was personally taught by Jesus Christ. All right, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Now it gets very personal to the believers in Corinth. To the, to the knuckleheads that uh, that church had trouble, right? They were very schismatic. They were very divided. They were kind of split into four different camps. And Paul just had to remind them, you know, you seem to have these, these allegiances to these other three besides me. Who's the one of us four that planted this lampstand? Who's the one that led you to Christ? And it, it was Paul. All right. If to, are you not my work in the Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Okay? It would be like Austin Bible Church wondering if, if I'm a pastor or not. You know, I'm like, seriously? You know, you want, do I need to show my ordination certificate? I mean, or, or has it kind of become obvious here, you know, at some point? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Even if the whole rest of planet Earth just dismisses Paul as an apostle, the Corinthians can't. At least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now he goes on, he says, my defense to those who examine me is this. And this is a larger context, that, but I think it, it speaks well to a lot of things with respect to the apostolic ministry. Um, do we not have a right to eat and drink? I mean, we expect it to, <laughs> you know, uh, just expected to starve to death and, and die of thirst. Is that what you expect? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife? You're going to mandate celibacy like the Roman Catholic Church? What are we doing? Even as the rest of the apostles, notice, as the rest of the apostles, they were all married men. We know Peter was because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. I, I still can't figure it out. I mean, that's the only way I know to get a mother-in-law. You've got to marry a woman, right? Take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas. This is another clue, too. I think the rest of the apostles, the brothers of the Lord, James and Jude, and Sil all four of them became apostles after the resurrection. And, of course, Cephas. Or do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? This is curious, too, because there are people that try to defend the fact that they don't want Barnabas to be an apostle. Well, I'm sorry. The whole logic of this paragraph demands that Barnabas is just as much an apostle as Paul is. Do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? 
Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? You know, his grace ministry, he didn't have to have the grace ministry that he had. He could have been fully supported and demanded it, but he never does because he's the apostle of grace. Anyway, there's some other issues there. Let's go over to chapter 15. Very well-known passage here. 1 Corinthians 15, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. This is when you preach the gospel to believers, obviously, right? You preach the gospel to unbelievers because you want them to get saved, but you preach the gospel to believers because you want them to remember that they are saved <laughs> and other reasons. But I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and which also you stand. See, you're not done with the gospel just because you got saved. You continue, you hear it, you believe it, and then you stand in it. You've been introduced by grace into this hope and this faith in which we stand, this grace in which we stand, by which also you are presently being saved. That's phase two salvation, saved from the power of sin. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. This is his uh, seminary training from Jesus Christ. He received it, now he's delivering it. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Remember that sign of Jonah? Three days and three nights in the whale? According to the scriptures, Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. When did he rise? On the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared. Now, when we get here to verse 5 and following, this appearing, these repeated appearings, these are important. This is not just showing off and saying, ta-da, here I am. These are appearances that are commissions apostolic commissions. Notice, he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. The very first one he appeared to was not Mary Magdalene. I mean, technically it was. Okay, She was the first one at the tomb. She was the first one to recognize him. She went and got Peter and brought Peter. But he didn't commission her as an apostle. In fact, there are no female apostles, okay? So the first appearance with an apostolic commission is to Peter, Cephas, okay? Then the 12. Then the 12. He appeared to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Okay, now these are, it's not just, you know, like I say, it's not just showing off and saying, look, I'm alive. That's part of it. But proving himself alive to those who knew him when he was alive, you know, does it do you any good if someone comes back from the dead and you never really knew him while they were alive, <laughs> right? They come to you and they say, hi, I'm so-and-so. Like, really? Oh, I don't know. Who are you? But to appear to someone that knew you because you were a follower, you were a disciple, you were an eyewitness of his death, an eyewitness of his burial, eyewitness of his resurrection... And now you're commissioned to proclaim that even when it costs you your, your death. Most of these guys become martyrs. Almost all of them. There's no, uh, they have no incentive to lie because <laughs> they're going to pay for the truth with their life. All right. He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And when he says, most of whom remain until now, what does that mean? Does that mean uh, February 15th, 2023? No, until now means until the writing of 1 Corinthians. Okay, this is, this is extraordinary. You know, we can date 1 Corinthians in the early 50s, 51, 52 AD, the early 50s. And most of the apostles are still alive. If this is a lie, it's very easy to disprove. 
You don't want to say, yeah, I got 500 witnesses, and then you can't produce any of them. There's a tremendous apologetic value to this passage here. Most remain until now. Some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. James is his brother, his half-brother, the, the, uh, the author of the book of James. Mentioned among the brethren of our Lord in, in chapter 9. So he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. It still kills me that some people think that only the 12 are the apostles. No, wait a minute. The 12 are in verse 5. All the apostles are in verse 7. That's more than the 12. And just plainly. And then last of all, this is key, because this happens about two years later, ballpark, okay? If Jesus is crucified in 33 AD, we can put the Damascus Road at 35, ballpark, okay? Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. And the Apostle Paul's calling was unique, unlike any other apostle, so by the way, when it says to all the apostles, that includes Barnabas, okay? That includes every living apostle minus the apostle Paul. Because last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So if you encounter somebody today who claims to be an apostle, ask him to, uh, to testify to how his apostolic calling preceded the apostle Paul's on the Damascus Road because he clearly must have had his apostolic calling prior to Paul, when Paul said, last of all, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. One of my favorite verses anywhere in the entire Bible is right there. I've said it before, Sharon knows this, I, this if she's going to put something on my, on my, uh, an epitaph on my tombstone or whatever. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. That's what it's about. All right, so this is the nature of an apostle, Okay. There's other things that go into it. There's other things with respect to the signs of a true apostle were performed among you. Um, there's other things that go with that as well. What's that in 2 Corinthians? Um, the signs of a true apostle were exhibited among you. Oh. Let's search all passages. If you happen to know the verse, just let me know. There it is, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. You know, this is why the apostles, the prophets, this is why in the early church they had gifts of healing, they had miracles, they had tongues and the interpretation of tongues. All of these sign gifts were sent by the Holy Spirit in order to validate the apostolic ministry of the early church. Why would we have apostles today? Are we still laying a foundation 2,000 years later? Does God need to validate authors of, of the canon 2,000 years later? No, the canon is closed. Revelation ended with a curse to anyone who tries to add, do it. You don't add to the word of God, don't take away from the word of God. There's no more Bible being written today. So we don't need apostles and we don't need the signs of an apostle. All right, Paul, an apostle, by the will of God. By the will of God. All right, either by or through the will of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Or through the will of God. Different ways that you can read the prepositional phrase. Ooh, this is a fun exercise for those of you in tomorrow night's Greek class. Prepositional phrases. 
Won't be tomorrow night, okay? <laughs> We're just getting started. But, uh, but we will come up, and you're going to learn the difference between N and Dia and Epi, and we're going to learn all the different prepositions. And we're going, to use, we're going to learn how they change if they take, if the preposition takes the genitive, or if it takes the dative, or if it takes the accusative. We're going to learn all of these, uh, these uh, aspects of, of Greek grammar. All right. By the will of God. An apostle by the will of God. Does this give you comfort? Knowing uh, not just the apostles, but all of us today, where you are right now, your gift, your calling, your, your field of service. If, if you are saved unto good works that are prepared beforehand, and you are, the book of Ephesians is going to teach us this. If you are, if you are by grace or saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. God knows what he's doing. And he has crafted you for his good pleasure. And he has placed you and he is using you and where you are, your field of service. You can say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And in the will of God, I am what I am. So by the will of God. This is a, this is a great encouragement. And uh, this is not the only place where Paul references this. In fact, it's fairly common in his, in his um, salutations. Okay? In, in 1 Corinthians 1, he uses it. He says, Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. There he stresses the calling. Okay? Uh, by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. He addresses that to the church in Corinth. Second Corinthians, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, different co-author, but he's in the will of God as he's called as an apostle. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Colossians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints in Colossae. Notice, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, very similar to how Ephesians starts. 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He talks about it a lot. I find it curious. Were there, we know he had critics. We know he had adversaries. We know that there were folks that would prefer that he just go away, <laughs> right? They had folks that, uh, that preferred others in, in his place. He says, no, I'm, I'm an apostle in the will of God. Pastors today can say, I'm a pastor in the will of God. I've been assigned this lampstand by Jesus Christ. That's actually a, a very healthy um, mindset to have, for the pastor to have and for the flock to have. If the flock thinks that they, they control the pastor, wait a minute, I'm a pastor in the will of God. Jesus Christ holds me in his right hand. Jesus Christ assigned these sheep for me to shepherd. <laughs> and what, what might the sheep be able to say? A, um, a sheep of the flock of Austin Bible Church by the will of God. Because the, the souls that are allotted to the shepherd's charge in, in 1 Peter chapter 5. It's all in the will of God. He tweaks it a little bit, uh, slight different expressions in Galatians 1.1 1, 1 and 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. In Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul says, An apostle not sent from men or through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. All right, now that's not, you know, I mean, it's, it's related. It's, you can see it's, it's an equivalent expression. He doesn't say in the will of God. He says not sent from men or through the agency of man. In other words, it's not a human exercise. I like that. Or 1 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the commandment of God our Savior. How about that? Not only is it God's will, but God commanded it. In Christ Jesus, who is our hope. Back in the day, we did a study in basic doctrinal studies called Thelematology. It's the will of God. And I recommend it. If you've never been through it, go through it. Get it off the website, just go through those classes, read through the notes, grab a notebook off the wall in the hallway there. Uh, basic doctrinal studies. There's 10 different doctrines 
that apply for, for new believers, for all believers, the basic doctrines of the faith, and one of which is called, I called it, thelematology, the will of God. The verb thelo, the noun thelema, speaks to the will of God, okay? And it's, it's a very significant doctrine. We have to keep ourselves in the will of God. Uh, if you don't know the will of God, you're a fool. That's not me calling names, that's Ephesians calling names, okay? Ephesians 5.17, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The will of God is critical. We have to center ourselves in the will of God for everything. And this book's going to help, uh, help us understand that. All right. Well, there we go. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. We'll uh, pick up here Sunday morning. Lord willing and rapture pending. Father, I thank you for truth. I thank you for the blessing that we have to just get our first taste of this powerful book. I thank you for all of the doctrine that's here, the, the length and width and height and depth. I thank you for the basic doctrines. I thank you for the intermediate doctrines. I thank you for the deep doctrines. And Father, we're not afraid of any of it. Your Holy Spirit leads us into all things, even the deep things of God. And so, Father, I just give you the praise and the glory for this night. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for hungry brothers and sisters that, that uh, have made the word of God their number one priority. I thank you for our visitors. I thank you for all things on this night, Father, just giving you the praise and the glory. In the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Austin Bible Church is a grace ministry. No price is ever assigned to any video, audio, printed material, or anything provided by this ministry. Costs associated with such grace provision are paid in full by grace-oriented, born-again believers in Jesus Christ, motivated by God the Holy Spirit, well-pleasing to God the Father. More information on our grace-giving policy and your opportunity to join in this Grace Financial Fellowship can be found at the link in the description below.